Proteins are constantly moving all over the place. These changes can be little, they can be big. And they're really important for how proteins function. So you might see like static pictures of proteins, like say like crystal structural models. And those are just looking at a single snapshot of a protein. But proteins are really like moving all over the place and it's really, really cool, but it's hard to study. Um, so today I want to tell you more about like these conformational changes proteins can make often in response to like binding something or um, being modified, like being phosphorylated. So having this negatively charged group sticking on them. And then they're like, ah, what am I gonna do? Because the reason proteins are changing shape and stuff is because they're getting different options. And um, the proteins get their sh shape from all their like amino acids that make them up that have all these different preferences, like where they wanna hang out. And then if that where they wanna hang out depends on the options around them. And so if you give them new options, um, then these guys might wanna change. And then these guys are like, whoa, wait, where did you leave me? And so you can have changes in like one area of a protein, like ripple through. So you can talk about like allosteric effects where like if something happens to this hand, then something's gonna to happen to this hand. So it's like, whew, and now this hand's weird, even though something happened at this hand. Um, and so this can like ripple through membranes. Basically there's a lot of really cool stuff. Plus there are regions of proteins that are just like intrinsically disordered regions or like IDRs. They're kind of like my hair. They're just like all over the place and they don't have any like set structure, um, at least normally. And then sometimes when they bind something, they adopt the structure, but they're really good for like holding things together um, and like as scaffolding rolls. Um, and they can also make like these phase changes where like, they get the stuff around them to kind of like, they make this like jellification thing. Like they have this little blob in your cells where like the things that are needed for some process are all kind of like kept together so they can't float away. So some really cool stuff um, that's happening at this, like in this area um, where there's like these conformational changes, there's the ICRs, there's the stuff that you can't see with the techniques that we normally use. Um, there are techniques that we can use to study this sort of thing. Um, so I want to tell you about some about those, about like what we can and we can't tell from different methods. Um, um, as well as um, some cool ways that people study this sort of thing. Um, and yeah, so let's jump in. So I think there's this tendency to think of proteins as kind of like static things. I know that when I first was like introduced to like structural biology, so the, the field of biology that kind of like looks at proteins and other molecules like RNA or DNA looks at their shape and how that relates to their function. So you see these structural models of proteins, like crystal structural models like this. Um, so this is the protein I started the ego. And so it's easy to think, okay, well, this is what the protein looks like all the time. But as it happens, ego actually is a great example of conformational changes happen that can happen. So these shape changes. So I'm not going to bore you with the details of RNA I because I've talked about it over and over but basically this ego protein it binds to this small RNA and this this RNA sequence is going to dictate um, a messenger RNA that's going to target um, for degradation you don't know you need to know the details here um, but much more in it in my post about RNA I if you're interested because I think it's really cool but anyway so it binds to this micro RNA now what happens is when it binds to a target so now this is with this like seed region now it's opening up and now if you have a longer target where you're actually pairing here as well, now it's opening up even further. And so these are examples of conformational changes that are happening in the protein in response to binding to something, in this case, to an RNA. Another really cool example of a conformational change is actually the spike protein um, from the coronavirus. So actually what it does is basically the spike protein it, but when it binds to this ACE2 receptor and gets cleaved um, by a protease, then this like this part is actually going to fall off, and this part that's left behind in the viral membrane it goes like, and it inserts itself into um, the cell membrane and like drags, um, pulls them together. Um, so you get this um, this totally like elongated complex, and so it's really 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 dramatic shape change. Um, and so more on that in other posts. And actually the, like um, you might've heard like the polyproline substitutions that are made um, to the recombinant protein. So the protein that's like expressed and used um, to study um, because it helps like make it stabilizing it, prevent it from doing this like dramatic shape change. Um, and so, yeah, so that's a very dramatic um, conformational change in action. 
And proteins can also um, make other shape changes, um, sometimes in response to binding, sometimes in response to being modified, like maybe a post-translational modification. Um, so something like phosphorylation or acetylation or methylation. Um, so basically these proteins, they have, they're consisted of these chains of amino acids and these amino acids have all these different properties that I talked about way more extensively in other posts, so I'm not going to go into here, um, but, but these are going to influence how the protein is going to fold and then how it's going to function because the protein wants to kind of like optimize all of the interactions it has. Um, and so when you're doing using a post-translational modification, so something that's added onto an amino acid after or gets linked into the chain, so after like the protein's already made, well, now the protein has to kind of like figure out like whether it wants to refold a little. Um, and so you can get these effects um, when you have like a post-translational modification, and you can also get effects when you have something binding, or you can have effects when you change the environment, maybe, maybe you change the temperature a little. So when you're making changes to a protein or to the protein surroundings, you giving it more options, now it might have, it might prefer new things. Um, and so proteins can take on these different shapes um, and the shapes, um, we call them conformations. Um, and so it's the same protein, um, just kind of in a different shape or orientation. Um, so like, like my hand's bent or flex or blunt or flex or blunt or flex or whatever. Like my hand could go back and forth between these and there are different conformations. Um, so typically there's a protein will have sometimes have like multiple conformations that are like pretty stable. So it might alternate between this and this and this and this and this and this. But, um, and then the others, like the transient states are uh, just like transient. Other times proteins are kind of flopping all over the place. And a lot of times we really don't know because our techniques basically we're looking mostly at what we can get a snapshot of. So we see the protein like when it finds a happy place and then we take a picture of it. But we often don't know what's happening in other parts of the protein or in the protein at other times. Um, and so we, there's also like, so when you have these changes in the protein, so we often call like the, like the, we can talk about structural domains of a protein. Um, and so like these regions that you could basically, if you were to cut these regions apart, you could basically, these would fold independently. That's kind of like the strict definition of a structural domain. Um, but sometimes they also do need other parts of the protein or whatever. Um, but these regions, they, they tend to have like, strong secondary structure. And so a secondary structure, this involves um, interactions between the protein backbone. So these amino acids have these, um, so the amino acids have this generic backbone and these unique side groups or R, um, side chains or R groups that stick off. And that's where they have these, all these different properties. Um, but the backbone itself, that generic part can also make important interactions and it can make the, do these like hydrogen bonding, which is like partial charge, partial charge attractions. Um, the special type of them that are kind of, um, that are going, and because you have this backbone, you have this regularly spaced um, acceptor and donor based for giving the, for doing these hydrogen bonding, you can get these characteristic um, structures, these secondary structures. So we talk about different layers of protein structure. The secondary structure is where you have, so the primary structure is just sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure is going to involve backbone, backbone interactions. Tertiary, you're involving the side chains. And quaternary is where you have like multiple chains interacting. Um, and so the secondary structure is involving these backbones because you have this characteristic spacing. Um, there's these patterns that are found often the secondary structure like motifs. Um, these common ones are like beta strands. Um, so these individual ones are beta strands, then they can pair up into beta pleated sheets. So each of these would be a strand. And then when they come together, you um, the, these are pleated sheets. Um, we call them pleated because they actually have this like zigzaggy pretty cool. Um, and then the alpha helices, how are you kind of have these loopy loops? Um, and so these are the common, a couple of common structural motifs. And then there's also others. And basically the basic idea is that proteins have a lot of combinations of these, um, these motifs, um, as well as like linker regions between them that are tend to be more flexible. They can have like turns, um, various things, but parts of the protein are going to be more like solid, more stuck. 
um, and then parts of them are more flexible. And these flexible regions are often where you can have kind of movement between the domains, but you also have movement of the protein, just kind of like general fluctuations and kind of just like random moving around. Um, but nothing as dramatic because these proteins, like you have all these strong interactions between everything. They're kind of like helping keep things together. Um, so whereas these flexible regions are more flexible. And so you can see things happen where you have these domains maybe like brought closer together or farther apart. As we see with the structure of Argonaut, it's this most of it is pretty stable, but this part is moving away. Um, and so what's really cool that I'm not going to get into is that we don't even we don't even have a structure of ego in the RNA free form because it's just like way too flexible. So um, I actually did some work with the technique I'll tell you about later, this HDXMS hydrogen exchange GM exchange mass spectrometry, which actually looks at the backbone. Um, and you can see that with the RNA free ego, it's like totally exposed and flexible and dynamic and it's really cool. Um, and it's explain why we can't get a crystal structure because for a crystal structure, you have to get the protein to like stay still. Um, and so these changes, so these changes um, often happen. So you can see with, with this, you're seeing like this kind of like hinge like movement of these domains away from these domains. Um, you can also have movement within domains um, and the, they, the changes can be subtle or dramatic. Um, what's really cool too is that you can have changes in one place of a protein affect changes and affect things in other parts of the protein. And so we can call these like allosteric effects. There are different types of allosteric effects we can talk about. Um, so common places where you'll see this allostery um, mentioned are if like with enzyme inhibition. Um, so often, so a substrate is the thing that an enzyme acts on. So an enzyme is a reaction speeder upper or helper. Um, so basically, if this enzyme, if this substrate is this green thing and it binds this green thing, it's going to do something to the green thing. And this is what the enzyme like normally does. This is it's like functional stuff. Um, you can have a competitive inhibitor which mimics the um, the substrate. So it looks like the thing that it normally binds and acts on, but it doesn't it can't act on it um, and then it won't like do stuff. <laughs> um, but then you can also have like an allosteric inhibitor where it's going to bind to somewhere else on the protein, but it still prevents this from binding or it somehow inactivates this site, even though it's not binding directly into the active site where the substrate normally binds. Another place you'll see allosteric effects is where, like with receptor um, by, like by binding, um, like receptor proteins. Um, so these often like span through a membrane. And so you have some sort of thing that the receptor binds to, a ligand. Um, and so different receptors will have different ligands that they recognize and bind to. Um, and what happens is that instead of the thing going through into the cell, instead of like transporting whatever bound out here into the cell, they actually what it's going to do is it's just going to re relay that signal through the, the protein, um, through the membrane and into the intracellular part of the protein. And often this part is going to be like attached to another protein, um, like often these little like G proteins um, that are going to do things with like GTP and then send a signal. Um, sometimes you have binding and then you have like receptors come together um, to like dimerize and activate part of the thing in here, which is gonna then activate a kinase, which is gonna send a signal. The basic idea is that you're having something happen out here. The signal is then kind of like rippling through the protein because when you're changing something out here, that out here part is still connected to everything else in the protein down here. And so you can have this signal kind of moved through. Um, and so we can talk about within, um, within, so we talk about like how you can have these like linker regions and that sort of thing that are kind of more flexible. You can also have regions of proteins that are just like super duper loosey goosey. Um, we call this like intrinsically disordered regions. Um, and so basically we, the, here we talk about like beta strands, we talk about alpha helices, there are some other motifs. Um, that we see where they basically have this strong secondary structure. But then there's also regions that we call intrinsically disordered regions or IDRs. And IDRs, well, we have no idea pretty much uh, what the heck they look like because we don't think they have any like set, um, set structure, any set shape. Um, they're basically really loosey goosey. And so if we try to measure their, take a picture of them, they're gonna be all over the place. Um, and so, 
um, but they're they're not like they're really really useful and they're really important and this is why you find them in all sorts of proteins and you find so you have some proteins where you have like IDR regions often at um, like the N and C termini so like the ends of the protein um, but then you also have proteins that are like practically all um, IDR. So part of the inspiration for today's post was the Olympics because I was thinking about how all of the athletes, um, I was watching like a snowboarding and they do these like crazy tricks and they'd be like stuck in a shot and then they go and they do another crazy trick and it's the same athlete. But if you were to take a snapshot of it like at top, they're in this like crazy different confirmation, this crazy different position than they were before. They're in different confirmations. Um, and similarly, proteins can be in different confirmations. And so that was kind of part of the inspiration. And part of the inspiration was about yesterday, I was looking up the this protein, um, TNRC6A, um, or like the human, a human GW182 protein, um, which is one of the proteins that's involved in the RNA interference pathway that I was talking about. And it serves as like a scaffold. Um, and so it um, kind of connects ego after it binds to a target to the things that are going to help repress the target. Um, and the way, <laughs> this way it's easy to do this is because it's got this like huge IDR stuff that can just basically grab onto a bunch of stuff and help bring it together. So it has little parts, some parts of it bind to ego, some parts of it bind to like decapping and decoupling things. But you can see that, this, so this is the predicted structure. This, we cannot, we would not be able to get like a crystal structure of this. Um, so you can get crystal structures of like little parts of it, maybe like these structural regions or parts of it bound to other things. But this part, so this is the alpha fold model. If you go to like the PDB and, or this is actually Uniprot, um, Uniprot and you like look up a protein, it'll give you, show you the alpha fold predicted model. And you can see that it has no clue what to do with this. Like it's very low um, confidence. Um, and so you can see that there's just like, who knows what the heck is going on out here. And what's going on out here is going to depend on what it's attached to. So that GW might look like this, this protein here, um, that's right here, the way I, I drew it like this line, you can see in the picture, it looks like a spaghetti with a meatball in the middle, but this spaghetti with the meatball in the middle is able to help connect all of these things. And it's that loosey goosiness, that flexibility, that spaghetti-ishness that's going to help um, bring things together. So, um, Sometimes these read this, it acts as like a scaffold. So it can bind to different things and bring them together. So as I said, some proteins have like distorted regions and some of them are mostly disordered. Um, and so although we don't have a structure for GW182, that protein I was just showing you, I was just showing you the predicted structure. Um, it's basically, it's because it's like IDR or whatever, there is no like set structure and there are tools that we can use to like look to see like predict IDR regions of proteins and that sort of thing. Um, but it has, it's basically, although we can't see the structure that kind of is telling us that we can't see is that there is no like set structure um, because it's preventing us. It's so loosey goosey that it's preventing us from using methods to look at it that require that you have set structures. And so when we're talking about extra crystallography or we're talking about a cryo EM as we'll talk about later, these basically, they require your protein to have these like set structures because you're going to be using those structures. Um, you have to get them. It, it's like you were taking a picture. It's not really taking a picture, um, but you have to if you can imagine that if the protein was just all over the place, then there's no way to get it to like stay still to take a picture for in terms of crystallography, or there's so many different ways that it's moving that if you try to like average them together, you're just gonna see like nothing, which is what the case with cryoia. Um, but this is making it really good for bringing things together. So sometimes they do adopt like a set structure upon binding to things. So they might be all loosey goosey and then they bind to something and then voila, you have a structure in that region. Um, and so they can also encourage um, the promotion of like molecular condensants or like phase transitions. You might've heard a lot about like phase transitions, um, like these like transitions where basically you have this like all the soluble stuff in the cell, it's all like floating around. Um, and then you have these like droplets form, these like, like droplets within the cell type of thing, like these kind of like goopy gluey jelly globs inside the cell that are kind of like this stuff is hanging out in there that like needs to be together to do something. So you can have these like condensants, condens condensate, I cannot say that, um, but basically things that are doing things like transcription or translation or some sort of process. Um, you can have these like 
membraneless bodies within cells or these little like clusters of things because in your cells like if you didn't have this like you have so much stuff going on in your cells like and if your things need to be like not on opposite sides of the cell they need to be kept together um and so in addition to actually like directly binding two things to bring them together these idr regions can help kind of like promote this kind of like making this all like just jelly gooey stuff that is going to hold things together um so it's pretty cool um, and so there's a lot that we don't know about IDRs, though. There's a lot that we even don't know about regions of well-structured proteins. Um, and this goes back to kind of like the techniques that we can use to look at things. So there are a few main structural biology techniques. Um, and so as I talked about before, structural biology is really where we're trying to get a look at like what proteins look like at the atomic level um, and how what they look like affects how they function. Uh, so a couple of the key methods that we use are like X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, and NMR. So I'm going to talk to you most about crystallography and cryo-EM. NMR is actually better for um, you doing like things that have more flexibility, uh, but you're limited to like smaller proteins and you need a lot of it um, in order to get the shape. But NMR involves this like complicated stuff physics wise, but it's like the nuclei are like spinning. And so you have like your protein spinning, it's like, yeah, it's complicated. Um, but the idea, but it's a solution based technique. So you don't have to get your protein to like stay still. Um, and so this makes it good if your protein is taking on a lot of shapes. And then instead, uh, the way you get like the structure, you often see when you see NMR structures, you'll see this in, so in ensemble. So they'll have like lots of different like structures. And so you're seeing a lot of different conformations. Um, and then you kind of see this like, you can see like the average of them, or you can see like all of these different conformations. So you see this ensemble, but this is like, um, so uh, this is good for like small uh, things that um, you can see flexibility. You often see it done for like very small regions. You can also use NMR to like detect changes um, in a region upon like binding to something or that sort of thing. But as I said, you need like small proteins and a lot of it. Um, and so, there's drawbacks to that. Um, there's also drawbacks to these methods. And so um, grossly oversimplified comparison, but basically with crystallography, what you do is you get this, um, your protein to organize into this orderly lattice, um, we call it crystal. And so you have to get all of the proteins to stay still in the exact same position. And so if you have a protein that's really, really flexible and loosey goosey, then that's not gonna happen. Um, and we, even then, we, even if we have a well-behaved protein, we're not going to see regions of it, as we'll see, show you in a minute. Um, but then the basic idea is you shine these x-ray beams at them, and then these x-rays are going to interact with the atoms in the protein. Um, and then those, are going to, those rays are going to get scattered. Um, those scattered rays are going to interact with one another. Um, and then we get this, um, they produce this, spot of, this uh, set of spots, uh, this pattern, we call it the fraction pattern, and then we can work backwards from that pattern to get an electron density map showing us where the electrons were. Um, so the electrons are like um, what's actually interacting, and so those are part of the atoms there. Um, and so the problem is that then we get this um, really mesh, we can get, we get this mesh basically that we then try to build the structure into so that we try to place the positions of the atoms in there. Um, and what happens is if you have like a really nicely ordered crystal and you have a really nicely behaving protein and you have good data, you're able to get really high resolution data. And so resolution refers to like the closest two things could be to before you can still like take, make them apart tell them apart. Um, and so a lower number is a higher resolution and better. Um, when you get up to really low res, so really high numbers um, in terms of angstroms, um, then it's really hard to like make out what it, what's there. And you'll see that you're actually missing the density for regions of a protein. So here's one of the structures of uh, protein that I was showing you before. This is one of the ego structures I was showing you. Um, and so you can see that in here, there's some dotted lines. And this is indicating that this region of the protein was unmodeled. Um, and so basically what you're seeing here is you're seeing a model. You're seeing what they built into the model, uh, what were they built into the mesh. And so this is actually done by Lado Kayim, who um, was a scientist in our lab that I actually worked with. And he's really great. Um, and it was a great mentor. Um, and, but you can see that if you go to like the sequence, 
um, that there's regions of the protein that are unmodeled. Um, and so you can see that these unmodeled regions correspond to regions where there's no predicted secondary structure. Um, so basically what happens is that because in crystallography, what's happening is you have the, the x-rays are getting diffracted. If you have a region that is like kind of loosey goosey, those it's kind of like gonna cancel out. And that's the easiest way to think about it. Um, but the, um, it can get really complicated if you try to go into like the actual um, optics and physics and all of that stuff. But the key thing to know is that what you're looking at whenever you see one of those, um, one of those like crystal structures is actually a model. And different regions of a protein might have better or worse, um, more, better or worse like density, better or worse resolution. And so that's not like the fault of the researchers, it's just like the fault of the protein kind of, it's really flexible, even though that's kind of where the fun can happen sometimes. But so you can see that in regions, there's like really, really nice density. But then in regions like this region that I focused on, you don't see like there's the protein, it's just like there's protein here, but it just doesn't, this region, so it's like, this will be shown in gray. Like this region, there is stuff here, but you can't see it. And it's just crazy because it all just like cancels out. And so you can't like see anything. It looks like there's nothing there, but the protein itself is actually there. And so that's like a, so you can have a similar sort of uh, problem with cryo-EM, but the benefit of cryo-EM is that you don't actually have to get your protein to crystallize and you can actually get it to see different conformations. So in the crystallography, because you have to have that orderly lattice where the proteins are all like arrange the same. So sometimes there could be like exceptions where you have like multiple copies of a protein uh, within like the unit cell, so within like the repeating part. Um, but normally you're only seeing like the confirmation that the protein was able to crystallize in um, because you make it freeze in place and all of them be frozen in the same place, so in the same confirmation. With cryo-EM, what you do is basically you let the protein like flop around however it wants, so you're going to have a lot of different confirmations. Um, and so the particles um, are going to be like randomly ordered and you like freeze them um, in this like really, really thin um, sheet of ice. Um, and then you basically take a lot, a lot of pictures um, and then you average those. Um, and so when you average them to find ones that are in like the same orientation and then you average those together to get the look. And so you can get, you can try to tease out different conformations because the protein is going to be in different views. So you need a lot of, the basic idea with cryo is like, if you were to look at a single particle, so like a single protein or protein complex, you're not going to be able to get a good structure of it. You need a lot, a lot, a lot of particles and you're gonna average them together, but you're going to average them together, the ones that like look the same. Um, and so you can see different views because the particles are rotating all around. So you'll see like top side, this, whatever. But all of this is like the same, the protein in the same conformation. So you need like views of it from a bunch of different com bunch of different angles of the same confirmation. But then you can also, if you have multiple confirmations, you can tease apart the different confirmations and then average their data together. But you need to have enough of those confirmations in order to see them. And then you have the same problem where if you have a really flexible region, then you're not going to be able to like average together the stuff from that because it's just going to like average out. Um, and so you can't detect those like intermediate steps and that sort of thing. Um, whereas if you have like a couple of confirmations that it can switch between, then you can often see this sort of thing. Um, so both of these techniques, you're going to have problems with IDR regions of proteins. Um, um, so one technique that you can use um, to get more information about regions that might not be cooperative um, for those structural biology techniques, um, there's this technique that I've used, um, HGXMS or hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry. So it can address like secondary structure. So things at the backbone level. Um, so strong secondary structure, basically, um, it's going to prevent the protein from getting labeled by this deuterium. Um, and so basically you have a protein and then you label it with deuterium, which is like a heavy water. Um, and then you do mass spectrometry. So you basically cut up the protein and measure the weight of the pieces. And if they've exchanged um, their hydrogens in their backbone for deuterium, then they'll weigh more. Um, and you'll see that they took up um, this deuterium. And this is important because the observable exchange is only going to come from the backbone amide hydrogens. So these are the ones that are normally um, involved in hydrogen bonding. 
So, and you need that hydrogen bonding for the strong secondary structure. So if you're tied up in strong secondary structure, you're not gonna have um, hydrogen, you're gonna have, those aren't going to be available to exchange um, for deuterium. And so um, you're gonna take up le more, um, less, and if you have flexible solvent exposed regions, they're gonna take up more. Um, and then you can get some information about secondary structure of regions of a protein that you couldn't see in your other techniques. Um, so I actually use this um, in my work. Um, so it's pretty cool stuff. But anyway, another way that you can kind of get a look at whether changes might be occurring is with um, a technique called like FRET. Um, and so FRET is based on a, like, this concept um, or this mechanism where you have like fluorescence, like quench fluorescence type of thing. So, or sometimes you have other variations where it just changes the wavelength. But the idea is that, so a flore in fluorescence, what happens is that you have like a wavelength, so energy, um, so light is um, a fluorophore. So the thing that is going to like fluoresce, is going to get absorb light of one wavelength and emit light at a different wavelength. Um, so basically light is these, um, these waves of energy, these little um, packets of energy called photons. And these have different energies um, that correspond to different wavelengths and different colors if you're talking them in the colored range. Um, and so a fluorophore is something that is going to absorb wavelength of one light and then emit it at a different wavelength. Um, and so there's some, um, there, basically you have this absorbance um, there's some, there's some kind of like wiggle room, so it's not just a single wavelength. But there's something wavelength it'll absorb and then some it'll emit. Um, and so what happens is that when you have a fret, you have instead of emitting light, it kind of emits energy to the, um, the, emit, the energy that it was going to give off as light. Instead, it gets kind of like stolen from um, a quencher that's nearby, or it's, um, it activates a quencher to give off its own light. Um, and so you can have, then you can either have like quench fluorescence or you can have different light waves being given off. And so what you can do is you can actually label different regions of your protein. So put like a fluorophore on one part of your protein, a fluorophore on the other, or in a quencher on the other part, or a fluorophore on one, and then an, um, another fluorophore on the other, but that recognizes the wavelength given off by the first. So if you shine the wavelength at the first likes, then the second is going to get activated, that sort of thing. So if you have a protein where you can basically, um, if you have like surface exposed like cysteines and stuff often, um, you can label the protein in different parts, um, and then you can kind of use that to assess whether regions of a protein are close together or far apart. And so then like if you bind something to it, do they come too close together? Do they go far apart? Um, and so there are various pro projects that you can do um, in that aspect to try to get an idea about um, some conformational changes moving in a protein. Um, so that's my big kind of long winded way of saying that proteins really aren't static things, they move around. Um, we're kind of limited in how we can perceive them because we can only really like see them when they're um, when they're like stuck in one place. Um, and so we there's like the secret life of proteins that um, we can't really see. And proteins are really dynamic and flexible and this makes them really fun, um, but also can make it hard to study when you're really interested in those regions that don't tend to cooperate with traditional techniques. Um, and so yeah, so proteins are really cool. They move around um, and they're fun to play with.